Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Happy Black History Month. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is our first annual Black History Month event that NIPSIA is hosting. My name is Victoria Hinkson, and I'm a first year master's student in international affairs at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs here at Carleton University. I am a co-representative of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee at NIPSIA alongside Veronique Cosette Sharkey and Carla Cisneros. It is truly an honor to have all of you here today to highlight the experiences of Black professionals in Canada. Today, we are going to be discussing how our speakers have overcome systemic barriers and challenges during, during their professional, personal, and academic careers. We hope that this event raises awareness on the experiences and discrimination that Black communities experience daily in all settings, while also highlighting and celebrating the success of our panelists. After the end of the panel, we will have a short Q&A period. Um, we hope that this panel is, again, an annual one. And I also would like to thank our panelists and Professor Adrian Harewood for being here as a moderator. I will pass the mic over to Carla Cisneros for our land acknowledgement. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Carla Cisneros, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Um, before we begin our panel for Black History Month, um, we would like to make this land acknowledgement as an intentional and thoughtful way to position ourselves and to provide meaningful and thankful acknowledgement to the indigenous communities whose land we occupy. We acknowledge that we live, gather, and organize on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. And before we continue, um, I would like to share a quote from Rosemary Brown, who was the first black Canadian uh, woman to become a member of a provincial legislature and the first black woman in Canada to run for leadership of a federal political party. She said, we must open doors and we must see to it they remain open so that others may pass through. Thank you very much to everyone in this panel for being here and for taking time today to share with us part of your life experiences and your wisdom. Your leaders and important change makers in our communities, in our workplaces, in the public service, in politics, and many other spaces, and you're opening doors and holding them open for others. And by doing so, you have empowered and inspired many people over the many years that you have done and work on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is truly an honor for all of us to learn from you today. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Yagadisin Sami, Director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, to introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carla. Thanks for pronouncing my first name. It's always a challenge. Uh, bienvenue à tout le monde. Bonjour, bon matin. Uh, très heureux de vous voir ici. Uh, il commence à faire beau. Uh, ça veut dire que l'hiver est presque arrivé à la fin. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many of you this morning. Um, we're joined by a panel of distinguished and accomplished individuals uh, whose bios are pretty long, so I'm not going to read all of them, uh, but I will try to extract what I could uh, from each so that you get a sense of who's going to be speaking to you. Um, I'm not going to do this in the order that people are seated because I'm just gonna get confused. So I'm just gonna go with whatever name is first on my list uh, that was given to me. Uh, we have Ariel Kayabaga, uh, who's a Canadian politician, uh, you can see uh, she's on the other side uh, of the stage. Uh, she was elected to the Canadian House of Commons in, in the 2021 Canadian federal election, uh, represents the electoral district of London West as a member of the Liberal Party of Canada. Anyone from London West in the, yes, in the room? Yes, a couple people actually. Well, they're not you? from there, but they were there. We okay, were there. <laughs> great. Um, uh, Ms. Kayabaga was born in Bujumbura, Burundi, um, so she moved to Canada when she was 11. Uh, she's a graduate of Carleton University uh, in, in political science, um, and uh, before her election she worked as a settlement worker for newcomers to London and also Sonia Ontario. Uh, we have Diana Kinema, who's an accessibility policy 
analyst at Public Services and Procurement Canada's Accessible Procurement Resource Center. Uh, she holds a diploma in procurement, logistics, and supply, supply chain management, and an MA in public ethics and policy from St. Paul University. Uh, next to me is Richard Sharp, who's been a human rights advocate for 30 years, both at community and institutional levels. Uh, Richard is currently the director of the Black Equity Branch, Treasury Board Secretariat in the Ontario Public Service. Uh, we have Faduno Ali, who's a planning advisor for the Diversity and Inclusion Directorate of Inclusion. Uh, she's a change agent with over 14 years of experience working for the Department of National Defense, where many of our students end up working afterwards. So I'm sure you'll want to speak with her uh, at some point. Uh, she has led, collaborated on, and co-created a number of anti-racism, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, both within DND and across the Government of Canada. Samantha Munsami, Section Head Lead Advisor for Diversity and Inclusion, Material Group, National Defense. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought you were from Mauritius because of your name, but you're from the Caribbean, so I can see where, <laughs> where this uh, name comes from. It's a very familiar name to me. Yes. Uh, she has spent over 15 years in the public service, working in numerous communications, outreach, and engagement initiatives that focuses on the people's side of business. I should mention I'm from Mauritius, which is why I look at names very carefully. Uh, so she, uh, she has a, a master's degree in communications and culture and spent some time in Toronto and Barbados during her master's degree. Uh, she has worked and studied in India, China, France, and the Caribbean. And then we have Olivier Jardin. I hope this is how you pronounce your name. Is a lawyer and public policy advisor who recently finished a contract as chief of staff and legal counsel with a startup advisory firm Climate and Nature Solutions. He's the former Director of Policy and Legal Affairs to Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities and a former Policy Advisor to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Uh, Olivier holds an MPhil in International Relations from the University of Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. Do you have any questions that you want to pose for our panel? Is there a microphone? Yeah, please, go ahead. No, I don't think so. No. Oh, there is a microphone. My question is, uh, as black professionals, how do you deal with two things that are very related? One is pretty brand new, well, relatively. One has been there forever, but I have a new term for it. So the, the new thing is the incredible pushback against equity that's fueling things like the popularity of uh, Jordan Peterson. The related thing that's been there forever, but I have a new name for it, is everyday white supremacy. So the link is, so I went to see uh, Jordan Peterson when, when he came here on, on January 30th. Uh, <laughs> at the Canadian Tire Center, it was like 5,000 white people and me. Right? Um, and the, the every, so an example of everyday white supremacy was 5,000 white people paying $80 to go see a white guy who says that uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion is the evil trinity. He was speaking for two hours and whiteness never being mentioned. So as professionals, how do you deal with those two things? Does someone want to take that question? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to, but Rob, Robin's heard me say this many times, and, and for folks who don't know Robin Brown, he's the head right now of the 613819 Black Hub here in Ottawa, doing some amazing work that I can't do anymore because this is space where I am tired. And he also helped build the, the first national uh, federal black employee caucus in the federal government. Um, and so, which became the precursor of some of these other black networks. Uh, so, um, you know, again, kudos to all the amazing work that you guys have done. Uh, we were the elders that ended up starting it. Um, with respects to, uh, I guess, both uh, those, those, those questions in terms of the pushback and you know, what you call everyday white supremacy, which is Canada, really. It's, you know, the normalcy of anti-blackness. Well, the UN said, right, when they came in 2016, the UN, United Nations came to Canada in 2016 to um, uh, assess the state of, of people of African descent in this country. The Canadian government opened the door and said, yeah, come on in. We, we have multiculturalism. We have employment equity. We're a wonderful country. We love black people. You can come in. And so when they did come in, they found that, wow, you know, anti-black racism is normalized. It's, it's within every institution. It's everywhere. Um, so people, it's so, it's so normalized that people just think that it's normal that there are over-representation of blacks in prisons, no representation in leadership. That's normal because, you know, white people are leaders and black people are not. 
So um, how do you deal with that? Um, again, I'm taking a, a page out of my mom's book, and I think some of the folks talked about this on the panel, is that we under need to understand how white supremacy and anti-blackness is fueled by fear. And if you understand the fear and where the fear comes from, then you can sort of tackle where the problem is at its root. Because you're not going to rationalize with the, the Peterson and his followers of the world because they're afraid of, uh, what do they call it, the Great Replacement? They're afraid of, they're afraid of the, 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 the impending democra global democratic demographic change on this planet where we're going to move from, you know, 10% of black people, um, uh, you know, coming out of the African continent to 25% of uh, people in 30 years making up this, this, this planet because of the decline of birth rates everywhere else, right? So the fear of extinction, the fear of a black planet as Public Enemy sang in the 90s, that was my favorite band, by the way, Public Enemy. Um, the, if we understand where that fear is coming from, then you can tackle it from a place of love, empathy, and compassion. So I know white people are afraid of me. And so when I engage with them, I hold that fear close. I let them know that I'm not going to hurt them. And that my contributions and our contributions to this work as I said before, and I, I was a bit flippant when I said, you know, I'm going to go to the prime minister and talk about change, Salve Savior's country, so this, this country, not his country, this country, is that we will save this country from itself, right? So if you know what's coming, and some of us who can see through the code, like I said, and we, and we know history, we know the patterns of, you know, change and revolution, then it's within the interests of everybody to support a, a peaceful transition to a, a different state. I won't say transition of power, but a different state of being in our society where we don't have a white dominant and a, that, uh, a hierarchy, a stratification of race and power and class and opportunity with black people at the bottom. Because guess who's at the bottom? I, how I don't feel I should be and then my children should be. So, you know, again, you know, Compassion, a uh, little bit of love, certainly conviction, knowledge, like all the things that we embody on a daily basis. That's how you tackle these, 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 these folks, right? Because if they're only fueled by everything that they say by fear, then that runs out when the fear kind of dissipates to some extent, and there's reason, there's logic, and they're countered with um, that, that love and compassion. And by the way, I wanted to just one, one quick intervention with what I said before. As much as I don't feel, I'm not sure, and I said I had a question mark, that there's a future for my children in this, in this country. This is their birthright. Canada is my birthright. I was born here in this country. My parents helped build it, and generations of our people helped build it. So before I leave, if I am to leave and take them, eh, I'm not going to leave without a, without a fight for my rights and my place here. But we need to determine at some point like other refugees in conflict, whether or not the, the struggle, the conflict, the war against you know, anti-blackness, white supremacy, is worth to continue fighting on this terrain or if you step out and come back in. So I'm taking a very strategic approach and very strategic discussion with how I live my life and my family's life with respect to what's happening geopolitically and within this country. So I just wanted to th throw that in just for some spice. <laughs> I, I know we're rapidly running out of time. Do we are we out of time or do we have more time? We have more time. Okay. okay. Can I? Um, Did you want to add something? Is it for doing? I, I, I do. I think uh, just just um, adding to what Richard is saying. It's very for me. It's very important because I I see um, like some of, some of the. Uh, faces on on some of you when you hear white supremacy um i think it's important to know what it is it's not an individual thing you know it's not it's not uh, uh someone pointing the finger at you as in you're the problem um it's a systemic issue it's a lot bigger than you and i and it's very important for for people to understand what it is um and, and, and can you break it down like what is it like when you talk about it being a structural 
Oh, problem. Yeah. What is it? What is what is it? What does that mean? So white so white supremacy is is our systems and structures that perpetuate mm -hmm. white dominance, white rule, white normalcy, uh, at the exclusion of other groups. Um, creates uh, systems of, of of fear and reproach to others, uh, and helps to maintain power with, uh, amongst uh, a few that subscribe to that group. Uh, and white supremacy works in multiplicity of ways. So black people can sometimes financially or politically benefit from white supremacy, but the entire group um, of blacks, racialized people, indigenous people are harmed by these institutions that are um, foundational to this country. That I, I don't want to go into the big long history thing. You, you, you know history, but Canada was founded on, on white supremacist principles, keep the blacks out. Um, to make sure that we indoctrinate everybody that comes here from Europe that says the indigenous are inferior and that we need to take over the, the land and be the caretakers, keep the Chinese out, bring them in as laborers, but we'll give them rights. So this is what build the wealth of this country. So we need to understand that. So when we say that it's normalized, people think it's normal that things are the way they are. They're not. There was a very carefully, strategically constructed plan to get us to today where we have these inequities. And so our job is to understand that history, not just in February, but the entire year, and then uh, work with people that are uh, here, uh, who have the energy and the passion and the desire uh, to help us get to a different place to change that, that dynamic. Because it's, it's a long, generations long process of undoing. You can undo 500 years of history in, in just, you know, a couple of years, right? Which is what we're asked to do in the federal government. <laughs> when, you know, and racism. It's like, well, geez. Guys. And, and yet, the, if Jordan Peterson were here, he'd say that, Richard, what you just said is nonsense. Look at, look at the fact that you have achieved a certain position in the society. You, you, you occupy a senior role. You've just been okay. given this appointment. How is it, this seems to be a, a contradiction in terms, how is it possible yeah. that, that, that white supremacy obtains when someone like yourself is able to achieve what you've achieved? I am an anomaly. I am an anomaly in the matrix. I know I'm an anomaly, and that's what makes me a little bit special. I know that. Um, not everybody's going to be able to take my path. I am here despite what the system says where I should be. So I can break that down historically, policy-wise. Politically, if Ariel was here, I could break it down politically because I've been here from the public service side. I can break it down because I understand all of these different systems. Jordan Peterson's um, um, you know, narratives fall apart when you deconstruct the systems that, that form the foundations of our society and our systems. Uh, so um, I'm not that concerned about people like him because they come and go, they make their millions and so on. But um, I would be more concerned if people think that, you know, we don't have what it takes to be able to counter the, the rise of this sort of white nationalism and, 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 and exclusionary thought. Um, last thing I'll say really quick, and when we're talking about leadership, um, because I think this is an important point, and why I don't subscribe to the Malcolms and the Martins of the world as the sort of, you know, we want to be like Malcolm X. He's like, I don't want to be like Malcolm X. He, he died. Martin died, Nkrumah died, you know, uh, Patrice Lumumba died. Um, what we do need is collective leadership. And so that each and every one of us inculcate some of this work, some of this knowledge and how to do. So that when I'm gone, because I will be gone, I promise you, I want to retire. I want to join my mom on that beach while she's still alive, right? <laughs> so who continues that work? Everybody can continue that work in their own way. And I think that Faduno or someone on this panel said that, do it in your own way, right? So, um, yeah, I'll stop rambling now because I, I take up a lot. Too much it, and, I, and I don't want this to be back and forth, but, but they died. But we're all going to die. It was how they lived, <laughs> right? They and lived. and one, could make the argue, one could make the argument that they're still living, yes. right? In terms of the example that they've set. Yes, yes, right? yes, so it's true. Yeah, they it's, died a violent death, but they died... Um, they lived well. It's it's true. They lived well. I'm not sure how well they lived at their at their end of days because they knew their end was coming and they would be violent and they had to sort of reconcile that. I I've read the memoirs from Malcolm and Martin, mm. a number of people. But but I do think you're you're right that they lived the life that they chose to live. I just think that we can live that life as activists 
uh, activist minded. I, I call myself a bureau activist because I work in a bureaucracy. I'm an activist. I'm an activist. I'm an activist. I create an term. But I think we can live that life without martyrdom. Right. That's okay. that's the sure. thing that I Okay. That I There's a question over here. Here. Yes, please. Hi. Um, thank you to all the speakers. It's just so lovely and encouraging to hear your experiences, um, to hear the strategies that you have for combating um, anti racism in the work for combating racism in the workplace. Um, I work at the Department of Finance Canada, and um, I think when you work in a space like that, you learn pretty quickly. Um, to paraphrase Sarah Ahmed, that when you expose a problem, you pose a problem, right? And you find out that uh, changing institutions is like coming up against a brick wall. There's so little that changes, and it can be so career limiting, right? And so I wrestle with these questions, right? Um, and um, oftentimes I tell myself, well, the struggle isn't itself redemptive, right? Like we have to keep fighting even though it's, it's coming up against, a, it's like coming up against a brick wall. Um, but other times the toll is too high and I just want to check out. <laughs> I just want to exit the fight and have a soft life as we say, right? And so I guess my question for you is how do you sort of, deal with the desire to sometimes leave the fight to others for one day to check out, right? What do you do in those moments when um, it feels like we're not making any progress, right? What do you do in those moments of extreme cynicism, right? Because we all want to be hopeful, but I think the reality is that Sometimes there's change, and then we take two steps backwards, right? Like so, how do you wrestle with um, that feeling that not enough is changing, not fast enough, that we deserve joy, we deserve softness, we deserve beaches and cupcakes, <laughs> right? Um, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Samantha, and then to do that. So to, to reiterate something, I love the word collective leadership that Richard brought up. Like, if, I think we can all write that down, collective leadership and community. I think you don't need to do this alone. Like, the reason why I'm still standing here and not on, like, mental leave is because I have a community, right? And I took care of myself. So I want you to remember that. You're not alone, but you have to find your community. And if there's, when you have energy, and another quote I always remember, when you're nervous, focus on service. When you're nervous, focus on service. I think about that every single day. So I channel my, that cloud you're talking about back into service. And suddenly, like, it, it starts to get grounded again, right? Olivia, we haven't heard from you for a little while. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, I think it's so important to take care of yourself no matter what, because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't help others. Uh, it's okay to take breaks. And what has motivated me is seeing the amazing work that that collective leadership is doing. So for example, when I uh, started working on the Hill in 2019, I met all of these black, indigenous, and racialized staffers who were doing absolutely incredible things in government and in their communities. And that really buoyed me. And, and I continue to work with some of these people. I actually was on uh, Ariel's campaign, um, who is also a former staffer um, in, in London West. So I, I guess, you know, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, and, and I really like uh, what you're saying about when you're nervous, you know, focus on service. Yeah. But do you know, and then Diana? Check out, recharge. <laughs> um, take care of yourself and then come back. You know, if you want to, because it's not it's not for everyone, but it's okay to check out as well. Yeah. Well, um, working for the federal government is like playing a game of chess. It has rules. So um, what I have, um, the strategy that I've used is that uh, I'm, I've learned to play the rules. When I started in the public service, I did not have mentors or anyone to guide me or show me the ropes to understand some of these rules. So usually I, depending on the situation, I become very diplomatic about it. If I find that it is not going too well, I check out as well. So I've been in the public service for almost six years now, and I've been, uh, I've been at three different departments. When I see that it's not working, I start looking. 
and so yeah. And then your mental health, you put yourself first. It's always very important. If you're not well, you will not be able to perform. It will affect your personal life. It will put, affect your, your work as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. put, always put yourself first and start looking. And network, network with the right people. Find your clan by your corner. If I need, you know, sometimes I reach out to Samantha. And I, I tell her, I vent to her. I said, Samantha, I'm going through this and I need that advice and, you know, so I find my clan and then I go there. I'm not sure if what I'm going to say is going to provide you with any solace, but, but, but part of the human condition is struggle, yeah. right? Like that's just, that's just life. And I think Frederick Douglass once said, no struggle, no progress. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's important is that you take joy from the struggle. Like there's a lot of joy in the struggle in spite of how difficult it is. Um, and also, really, really quick story. So in 1989, I was in Czechoslovakia. Right behind the, the Iron Curtain with a friend. I was traveling, I finished high school, traveling around Europe. And the system there, it was a totalitarian system. It seemed so monumental, right? Like at that time, at that moment, in the summer of 1989, a couple months before the, the Velvet Revolution that Václav Havel helped to lead, it was impossible to imagine that things would just change. And then a couple months later, they did, right? So it's hard to predict what's gonna happen in this world of ours. Like at that moment as well, and not to belabor the point, but you know, I went to, when I first went to university, Mandela was still in jail, mm -hmm. right? Like, and he'd been in jail for what, 27 years? And it was impossible to fathom that, what, five years later he would become the president of the country? Like how is that even possible, right? So again, we never know. So if you keep on struggling and keep on you know, building community, things can happen. You don't know what's gonna happen, right? Uh, like we're always making, like history can always be made. But at least that's my own approach. You, you know what else? Um, ce celebrate the small victories too, and the milestones, because that gives you energy. You know, we're not. Uh, it's not a. It's not a race to the the finish line. That's what that helps me. I hope that helps a bit. <laughs> One more question. Thank you everyone for such an amazing panel discussion. For the sake of time, I'll keep it short. I had two questions. Maybe I'll throw them both out there and you can decide which one you wanna tackle. Um, the first one is I really appreciate the conversation around generations. Like many of you or all of you, I had the talk when I was younger about having to work twice as hard for half as much. I know we talked about the future of black kids in this country, but I'm curious to know if, as some of you as parents who have different uh, children at different ages, have you had to have that talk with your kids? Did you have that talk with your parents? And uh, for your kids that maybe aren't older, 10 months old, do you feel that you will have to have that conversation with your son? Um, and then secondly, equity, diversity, and inclusion are buzzwords right now. And when I think about um, diversity, I think representation, but when I think of inclusion, I think of power. But I know um, after George Floyd and all that, a lot of my non-black friends were struggling with how to show up for people of color, particularly black people. So maybe to kind of, I don't know if we're gonna end with this question, but what does allyship look like? And maybe for those who are not black in the room that are looking for ways to support our efforts in changing or dismantling systems of inequality, um, how can they show up and support? Because sometimes I feel like the burden of care or activism falls on black folks. And it'll be nice to have that support. And I know that there are people that want to participate in those efforts. Hmm. Allyship? I guess anyone anyone like to take the question? Yeah, and I'm sure that um, um, others will have things to add. Um, on, on the first question, I'll just answer very, very quickly. So I, I'm expecting a child any, any minute now. Um, and um, I think, uh, thinking back to my relationship with my parents, it is so important to not only prepare your child for this crazy world that we live in, but when they face adversity, when, for example, institutions start telling you as a parent that your kid is somehow not performing in the way that he or she or they should be, be there for your child, because that's what happened to me, and that was the game changer solidarity with that child. Um, so I, that's one thing. And then for allyship, one thing that I think cannot be underestimated is sharing knowledge. So for example, if you are you know, a white person in 
a place of work and you've built a good relationship with someone else in that place of work, if you've been there for a while, you can help them understand how do you actually move ahead in this organization? What are the pathways to success? Um, what are the salaries that you should be making based on that person's uh, education and expertise? Because sometimes their actual salary does not match with that. I know that it gets sensitive, but I have done that work with people that um, have that have come after me, and I've found that to be incredibly empowering uh, and helpful in terms of building that sort of collective leadership within. You build uh, a more cohesive and strong team when integrity is at the basis of it, and I think that transparency and knowledge sharing is is paramount. I'd like to add something. Yeah. I'd like to add something to the question. I have two kids, and my oldest is in middle school. I have conversations about race all the time. Now, my son, who is 13, is in a special program called Franco Diffie. So he's a super bright kid, and so um, this program is de designed for kids like that. Before he got into the program, he was rejected the first time, and the excuse was that he didn't make a Mac, just one Mac. Now, what I did was that I stood up for him. I went to the school, I asked to speak to the principal, and I asked how many black kids were in that program. There was only one out of 28 kids. So what I did was I asked them, how can I get my son in the next term? They said he has to be at the SMAC. So I had a conversation with my son. You see how we struggle to get into these spaces? You have to work harder. So conversations like that encourages our kids to try better. Now, the second question of allyship, um, it's a difficult one. And I know that our you know, non-black folks are trying to learn our culture and then be a part of us. And I'm proud to say that at this meeting, my manager is right here to support me. She's sitting right there. She wants to know how she can support. So it is very important that you ask questions. How can I support? It is okay to try to help or to try and understand, but not to um, make the effort without asking because the perception that a, a, a non-black person may have as in helping will not be what we are looking for. So yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. Just, just, mm -hmm. just really quick, I'll try to, um sum this up, because I have like a five-step process for like being a good ally and all that. Um, but first, the first part of your question about, um, you know, what do you tell your kids? Uh, I give my, I tell my kids the truth. This is where we live. This is how they view you. And um, it's going to be difficult for you to, to live and operate in this society. Um, we're here to support you and help you, uh, guide you through that process. Um, they're not very happy when they go to school and they realize that that is exactly what their parents have told them. Uh, but I think when you're there as parents and you're there to support them, they're good with it. With respect to the ally thing, I totally agree with um, my colleagues on the panel. Um, um, if you wanna be an ally, I actually think that you should actually be a co-conspirator for change because allies tend to stand on the sideline and cheer you on. Good job, Richard, you're doing a great job, keep running. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually like to sit and have sort of white people pull me along so that I can rest if I'm gonna keep doing this work. So I'm looking for co-conspirators who will listen to what our issues are and concerns that uh, without fear, without judgment, um, without you know those internalized feelings of guilt, because guilt, white guilt, kills black people. And I'm, well, that can be another session. Uh, ask, as, as Diana was saying, ask what we need. And when we tell you, don't have fear, don't judge, right? Don't get defensive. If you're gonna say that you're gonna support and, we, and you ask, we're gonna tell you. Uh, and the third one that I'll end with, because there's more, is to create space for us. Um, my daughter was doing some activism work with some black group that the white kids would buffer themselves between the police, right? So they helped to create space for blacks to do their youth activism without being bullied and harassed by law enforcement. The white people that were there, because they're not going to get roughed up by the police in the same way that our black children will be. So there are sort of very concrete ways of doing that. There's just some examples. 
but to listen, to ask, and to create space. It could be creating space within your organization for black people to congregate without being seen as a threat to the organization. Why are those black people talking to water cooler? Those kinds of things. So I'll end there because I could go on and on for days, but it's a really good question in terms of having those conversations. Feeling and how the emotional state that people are in when they say they're gonna support is important in order for it to be authentic and not performative. So Dino, you, know, you were gonna say something earlier, I think. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot about allyship, but I, I wanna take the time to talk about the, the children um, it, w where I come from, we just demand excellence, not because you know you're black, you 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 work twice as hard or or whatnot. No, we just demand excellence. We demand you know for for them to do the best that they can um, and compete with themselves. Because I f I think when you compare your child to someone else, a different race, different ethnicity, different you know, and we're not just the color. You know, I I have so much, so many layers, like, like Samantha was saying, um, when you're comparing them to some, someone else, um, you know, that takes away, it gives power to someone else. Um, so it, it's really important in my household that we just, we want the best, um, not because you have to compete, not because of anybody else, but you as an individual. And that gives you the power, I think. Well, that was something. Thank you so much. I think we've reached the end of, of our panel. I, I'd like to thank all of you for your many contributions over the last 90 odd minutes. Uh, thank you for the incisive comments you made. Thank you for the provocative questions. Uh, and thank you for demonstrating to us various ways of being in the spaces that we, we occupy. Thank you so much. Remarkable panel, thank you.